archives of the Monastery of Hemis in Ladakh, India, is the ancient record of a man called Isa. The documents recall his presence and his travels in the first century of the Common Era, his periods of study in Hinduism and Buddhism in Puri and Ladakh, his travels through Kashmir, and his pursuit of truth, healing and enlightenment, as well as his opposition towards religious feudalism and elitism. Nineteenth and twentieth century researchers including Nicholas Notovich, Nicholas Rurich, Swami Abedananda, Maud Gask and Elizabeth Kaspari were all shown the ancient records. In contrast, the military representatives of the then governing British Empire were told that no such records ever existed. Why were the Indian claims to Jesus' presence, alongside ancient claims from Tibet, Japan, England and France, regarded as so threatening to the Christian orthodoxy of church and empire? Especially given the 30-year gap in the timeline for Jesus' life provided by the Gospels. When we come to Srinagar in Kashmir, to the shrine at Rosa Baal, we are faced with its claim to be the final resting place of Isa, known as Yus Asaf, the teacher, healer and leader of the healed, a first century Jewish man from Palestine, a man who had survived a Roman crucifixion, who lived and travelled to Kashmir where he taught and healed others until his death of natural causes at the age of 80. These claims may be supplemental to the Jerusalem tradition concerning the life of Jesus, but do they contradict Christian Orthodoxy's doctrine of the resurrection? Do they call the resurrection into question, or do they redefine it? Go to the Gnostic Gospels and you'll realize that in the beginning there was a big question mark over whether Jesus resurrected, as we conventionally understand it, or whether he survived the cross. And you might think, oh, well, the Gnostic Gospels might say he survived, but the canonical ones say he died, and then by a supernatural intervention of God, he came back to life. Well, it's not quite that clear cut. The Gnostic Gospels make very clear there was a question, what happened to Jesus? Did he really die on the cross? Did he survive it? What happened to him after he survived it? According to the historic creeds of the church formulated in the 4th and 5th centuries, Jesus died on the cross and three days later was brought back from death by a supernatural act of God. This is how most Christian believers understand the word resurrection. But in the kaleidoscope of early Christianity, was it always so cut and dried? What of the death of Jesus? The Apostle Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians appears emphatic that Jesus actually died. In the Gospels, Jesus appears to foretell his death and resurrection. Did his words imply that he would physically die and later return to life from death? Or that he would survive death, somehow snatched from the jaws of death? I find it very interesting that when Jesus foreshadowed his own resurrection, he spoke about the sign of Jonah. No sign will be given this generation except for the sign of Jonah. And of course, Jonah didn't die Jonah survived something that should have killed him, survived being swallowed by this fish and then spewed back up on the land. That's what Jesus is referring to. So his own image for the waking up and being again after the cross was not an image of dying and coming back from death. It was surviving something 
that could have killed him. So that's the Jonah reference, which is just intriguing. And then there is another resurrection in the canonical Gospels, of course, and that's the resurrection of Lazarus that Jesus achieves. That's an interesting template because Lazarus was brought back from the dead, but was still mortal and died. I mean, there were questions. John's Gospel tells us this right at the end. There were questions as to whether Lazarus had been raised a mortal, whether he would die now he'd come back from the dead. But he did, apparently, because there are no stories of an immortal Lazarus wandering around. So the other resurrection in the Gospels is of somebody coming back from the dead, living a mortal life, and then dying. And if you listen to the stories from out of Japan, it's of a Jesus who was there after the crucifixion, lived a long life, and then died. Same when we go to Kashmir. The story is of Isa, healer, teacher, leader of the community of the healed, but he's mortal. He lives until he's 80 years old, and then he dies. So there's the difference between the classic resurrection and ascension story and these other stories from around the world that talk about a mortal Jesus, one who may have had a family and lived and died in Kashmir at the age of 80. When the New Testament speaks of Jesus' resurrection, it uses two words. Anastasis simply means that Jesus was again after the crucifixion. Egethe and the words that derive from it mean that Jesus arose or got up. It is the same word used for when a person awakens and gets up after a night's sleep. To say that Jesus awoke, got up and was again after the ordeal of the crucifixion is more open language than the traditional story of a supernatural resurrection. You go to the root meanings, it says he awoke and was again. I think it's possible that that experience was elaborated into the church doctrine of death, resurrection and ascension. The ascension story is that his followers saw Jesus' body being taken up into the sky. What does that mean? Do you take that literally? What's a body going to do once it gets out of breathable atmosphere? There's going to be a bit more to that story, hasn't there? So either you're going to take it in a very nuts and bolts way and say, well, he must have been taken up into something to survive, or it's a metaphorical statement of Jesus transcending death. The church is actually trying to interpret what's happened, that Jesus was seen after the cross and then he wasn't seen. How do you write that story? How do you end that story? Well, the Apostle Paul does it with this long section in 1 Corinthians 15 about Jesus transcending death. And he effectively says, if, if Jesus' story ends with his death, then we're to be pitied more than anything. If there's no longer story, we're all wasting our time. But he uses phrases when he talks about Jesus transcending death, which are borrowed from the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra, which is all about that, that cycle of life I was talking about before, that transcends death, that talks about a conscious existence that proceeds, lives within this material life, survives it. And in the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra, we've got this description of the, the ascension of the master. And there are these phrases in it. We're familiar with Paul's version of it, where Jesus appears after the cross, first to Cephas, then to the Twelve, then to more than 500 on a single occasion, many of whom are still alive, though some have died. All those phrases are in the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra. Why would the Apostle Paul, if he's wanting to insist on the historicity of Jesus surviving death or being resurrected after death, why would he appeal to a Buddhist source? The Buddhist source from which the Apostle Paul appears to draw these intriguing phrases is an earlier form of the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra. It speaks of Shapas, 
the 12 reborn brothers, more than 500 witnesses who have died. The context is a teaching concerning the soul's journey through life and its transcending of death. Yet the context is not one of resurrection. It is a hymn of celebration at the ceremony of cremation of the body of the Master as his soul ascends to continue its journey. The message is of transcending death, a motif of hope and the vision of a longer journey. But it is not what Christianity has understood by resurrection. Many people listening to the Eastern stories about Jesus listen and say, well, this is just impossible because Christianity has become this narrow canon of stories and this narrow orthodoxy of theologies. And there's this notion that any information outside of the institutions that are married to this narrow orthodoxy is non-information, doesn't count. Doesn't count because it comes from a different culture, really, is the message. And yet, if we remember that in the beginning, Christianity was a kaleidoscope of experiences and ideas and theologies and practices, you look at that kaleidoscope, look at the Gnostic stories, look at the non-canonical texts that didn't find their way into what became the Orthodox mainstream Bible, and many of the aspects that relate to Vedic teachings, Tantric teachings, these are there in the Gnostic texts and in the kaleidoscope that was Christianity in the beginning. What are the secrets behind the correlation of names, themes, and actions shared by the biblical tradition and the traditions of the East. The similarities of Christos and Krishna, Abraham and Brahma, Sarah and Saraswati, Sephas and Shephas. The similarities of Buddha walking on water and multiplying food and Jesus of Nazareth doing exactly the same. Themes of the soul's journey are existence as conscious beings before, during, and after this material life. It's intriguing again because of this connection between the Christian stories and Eastern stories. It's also intriguing because in the beginning we realize it was not so cut and dried. The early words of the New Testament texts mean Jesus awoke and was again that's a far more open story than the church is often told. And if indeed it does fit within the idea of the soul that we find in the Mahaparinirvana Sutra or the idea of consciousness that we find in Plato, Paul being a huge fan of Plato, then it's a more open story. It, it shows Jesus as a model of all of us, that we're all on this incredible hero's journey. Writing in the fourth century BCE, the Greek philosopher Aristotle claimed that the Hebrew people had arrived in the Middle East from out of ancient India. The word Hebrew means nomads from the East. When I became a Christian, I was told that Jesus had emerged from the Hebrew tradition, which is from the Middle East originating in the Fertile Crescent. The story begins really with Abraham and Sarah emerging from a Sumerian-based culture, developing their own culture. The Bible grows up from there. Who were Abraham and Sarah? Where were they really from? Where was their culture from that it could be differentiated from ancient Sumerian-based cultures? In 2003, a chromosome study of the R1A1A haplogroup found a strong connection between Jewish priestly bloodlines of the Levitical families and the priestly Brahmin bloodlines from West Bengal in India. Perhaps the Hebrew tradition and the mysteries of ancient India are more connected 
than we'd ever thought. Make the journey to India, make the journey to the Vedic traditions, and you will hear the stories of Brahma and Saraswati, the progenitors of the many nations. And as soon as you hear that, you should raise an eyebrow and say, I think I know those names. Brahma, Saraswati, progenitor of the many nations. Go to the Hebrew stories and you have Abraham and Sarah, the progenitors of, and we usually say of many nations, Abraham, the father of many nations. What if it's the father of the many nations? What if Abraham and Sarah is really a very ancient primordial story of human beginnings? We could be looking at the same story. The Hebrew story could be a part of the Vedic stories of Brahma and Saraswati. And maybe we should think again, therefore, about what we think the Hebrew tradition is and where it comes from and where those tribes came from. I think we do our ancestors a discredit to think that everyone was locked in their tiny little region of the planet. I think the movement of human beings on planet Earth has always been much more fluid than we tend to give credit for. Maybe the antiquity of the Vedic traditions ought to command a bit more respect around the world, especially when we see that the Hebrew tradition may indeed be an offshoot of that ancient tradition. And I would suggest the names of Abraham and Sarah and the stories that emerge of them would support that idea. Another biblical story that connects Jesus with the East is the story of the Epiphany. Wise men from the East follow a light to a house in Nazareth because of a baby born to a Hebrew family. The wise men in question are not Hebrews, so they are not looking for a Messiah. They're foreign nationals, so they're not looking for a king. The story of the Epiphany in Orthodox Christianity is really intriguing because it's a story that stands on its own with a lot of mystery around it. Who were these wise men who've come from the East to honor Jesus? What are they honoring him for? Who do they think he is? If they're not believers in the Jewish Messiah, who are they honoring him as? In the Buddhist tradition, an anointed baby, one known in advance to be a great teacher and philosopher, is called a bodhisattva, a reincarnation of the spirit and consciousness of the Buddha. I think a lot of Christians would be horrified by the idea that Jesus could be a reincarnation of Buddha. Many people would hear that and say, well, that's blasphemous. Jesus is the son of God, the unique incarnation of God. He's not a reincarnation of somebody else. But the idea that Jesus might be a reincarnation of somebody else is in the Gospels, and I mean the canonical Gospels. Because there's a moment when Jesus asks his followers, who do people say I am? And they say, well, some say, some think that you are a reincarnation of Elijah or one of the other prophets. Now, I'll pause there because, of course, we immediately think, oh, yes, they mean a reincarnation of Elijah or one of the other Old Testament prophets. But if we're setting the Hebrew tradition in Vedic tradition could be another prophet, could be Buddha. Reincarnation of a great figure in the form of Jesus was something people were thinking about him in the Gospels. So we shouldn't be all shock and horror when we hear it suggested today. The notion of reincarnation was clearly part of the thought world that produced the canonical Gospels and the Gnostic Gospels and literature beyond. The worldview that we find in the Gnostic Gospels bears a lot of notes, and the same with the canonical Gospels, bears a lot of notes that we can find in Eastern thought. So, for instance, Let's think about this timeline for, for Jesus as a person, as a being, as an entity. If you go to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. 
And then the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as one full of grace and truth. And then at the end of John's gospel, you hear Jesus speaking to the source whom he addresses as Father, and he says, Father, now I'm about to return to you, back to the glory we enjoyed before the foundation of the world. And so you've got this cycle where where Jesus exists before this material life and after it. Now, 500 years before, Plato was suggesting that's the timeline of all of us, that we exist as conscious beings, then we have a material experience, and then we survive it. Early church fathers were open to it at the very least. If you listen to Origen and Clement of Alexandria in particular, they have that notion that that's true not just of Jesus, it's true of all of us. And they put forward the idea that we might have other lives after this one, on this planet, on another planet, in some other dimension. And when they get into that kind of language, and remember I'm talking about early Christianity here, that kind of language sits very comfortably in the thought family of the Eastern world. So you begin to see that the idea of reincarnation, reincarnation of Buddha, is not as foreign to primitive Christianity as you might first think. And when Jesus starts doing things like multiplying food and walking on water, things Buddha did, and when you read stories in the Gospels where people's names and place names appear in the sutras and in the Vedas, then you have to raise an eyebrow and realize we're looking at a great family of narratives and world thought. The church for 2000 years has wanted to present Christianity if it's unique and in a bubble, bearing no relation to international thought or any information any other culture would ever have received or understood. And it's simply not the case. Many of the stories which have circulated concerning Jesus' possible travels and the possibility that having survived the cross, he was taken out of Jerusalem and Judea and transported to India, revolve around the mysterious figure of Joseph of Arimathea. Not all the Gospels, canonical and Gnostic, include the trifecta of crucifixion, resurrection and ascension. But in those that do, Joseph of Arimathea is never far from the scene. The earliest Gospel of the canonical ones, Mark, makes no mention of the resurrection and ascension story. Uh, many scholars believe that Mark and Thomas represent the earliest documentary sources that attest to Jesus. Thomas, again, absent of the commonly understood themes of resurrection and ascension. Q is the same, it's not part of the Q sayings. So the primitive versions of Christianity don't have this long pericope about death, resurrection, and ascension. The Gospels that do, Matthew, Luke, and John, all talk about Joseph of Arimathea and him having a powerful place in the society of the day, powerful enough that he could go to the Roman governor and say, you better take those bodies down now. I know they've only been on there for six hours, but we've got a, a festival coming. You take them down now. I'm taking Jesus's body. I'll be looking after it. And he's listened to. And then he turns up at the crucifixion site. I'm having that body. And he's given the body. So that shows you how much clout Joseph had. Crucifixion was a very cruel and torturous way of execution because it took so long it would take between 24 hours and six days for most people to die of dehydration and asphyxiation on the cross. Jesus, according to the canonical gospels, was only there for six hours. And then Joseph of Arimathea, after Jesus has received some substance that's knocked him out, says, I'm having that body and you don't need to break his legs, thank you very much, and takes the body. What's going on here? We've got Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus is on the Jewish ruling council. And then this question of how have they got so much clout with Pontius Pilate that they can come to this arrangement? The second century Gospel of Peter adds to our information about Joseph of Arimathea. 
the canonical Gospels describe Joseph of Arimathea as an influential Jewish leader, a wealthy member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. Early narratives, indigenous to England, report that he was an international merchant with interests in British tin, a major commodity of that time. The Gospel of Peter claims that Joseph of Arimathea was not only close to the family of Jesus, and possibly was Jesus' uncle, but that he also had a strong friendship with Pontius Pilate. Could that be why Joseph of Arimathea was able to put a stop to the crucifixion of Jesus after only six hours and demand his body from the authorities? Furthermore, Pilate's wife had warned him not to be responsible for the life and death of Jesus. With his wife in one ear and Joseph of Arimathea in the other, does that explain why the Roman governor took Jesus down from the cross after only six hours instead of the days on end that was usually required? In the Gnostic Gospels, which hold a more diverse record of the ideas surrounding Jesus' life before and after the cross, another significant figure emerges, Mary Magdalene. Who was Mary Magdalene? According to the Gospel of Luke, Mary was a woman of wealth, part of a cohort of powerful women, which included Joanna, the wife of the Prime Minister or Chancellor to Herod the Tetrarch. These women, says Luke, were a vital part of Jesus' entourage. It was they, he says, who financed Jesus' public ministry. The Gnostic Gospel of Philip describes Mary Magdalene as the tower, the teacher, the closest of Jesus' inner circle, Jesus' companion, the one he would kiss on the lips. Once again, if you want to find an overlap between the Eastern stories of Jesus and early Christianity, you go to the Gnostic texts. In the Gnostic texts, Mary Magdalene is given a very different place to the one we find in the canonical Gospels. Mary Magdalene is Mary the Tower, Mary the Teacher. Mary and Jesus are the teachers. And there's this peer-to-peer -peer presentation. When you listen to the indigenous stories of Jesus that come out of France, you will hear Mary Magdalene mentioned there as well. Stories that Jesus was there after the crucifixion with Mary Magdalene and their family. And what's intriguing about that is that that tradition about Jesus is very connected with the history of the Cathars. Through the ages, a number of esoteric traditions have probed the ancient narratives surrounding recollections of Jesus and his family. Among them, a powerful and impressive faction within European Christianity a group in the south of France known as the Cathars. Their interest was in information carried by documents like the Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. The protocols they developed from these sources bear an uncanny resemblance to practices from the East, specifically from Tibet, and the protocols of Tantric Buddhism. The Cathars were a people group in the Languedoc, whose story really comes to a crunch in the 1200s, who had formed a, a better human society in the Languedoc through application of ancient wisdom rooted in Gnostic texts and indigenous traditions that spoke of Jesus and his family. And where this connects with the Eastern stories is that the Cathars' whole lifestyle and belief was built around reconnecting us with our light body. Wait a minute, where else have we heard that? We're talking about Tibetan tantric practice. 
Many scholars have noted Tibetan tantric ideas and phrases in the pages of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Tibetan Buddhism is a treasure trove of spiritual practices. They include protocols for connecting the practitioner with his light body to access advanced cognitive and physical abilities. They also include protocols for inducing a near-death state an initiatory practice that could give the appearance that the practitioner had died, yet remaining alive and able to be revived. But what were Tibetan elements doing in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene? Is it possible that Jesus, Mary Magdalene and those who wrote for them were far better travelled than we may have given them credit for? At that time, it was entirely possible, if you were Roman, in the Roman army, to be posted to Britain for a two-year posting. So you think about that, there has to be pretty good and fast travel around the world for it to be worthwhile to send someone for a two-year posting to Britain. That gives you a clue that travel was very easy. There was an ease to travel around the globe that wasn't to be replicated again until the 19th century. It would have only been a matter of maybe three months for Jesus to have traveled to India, for instance. So is our familiar picture of Jesus' family as a local, untraveled, working-class family a false picture? If Jesus was connected with a figure as powerful as Joseph of Arimathea, an international man of commerce, is it possible that the Joseph named in the Gospels as Jesus' father was something more than a carpenter? The word that we translate as carpenter is actually quite an elastic word. You could just as easily translate it as civil engineer. This is not the prosaic, working class, local story we thought it was. And again, you look at what that word can mean and it places Jesus in a much bigger world than we're accustomed to seeing him in. Could it be that Jesus and his early followers were part of a more international and educated demographic than the church is generally portrayed. The canonical gospel account appears to emphasize that Jesus had indeed died on the cross when a spear pierced his side and blood and clear fluid flowed from the open wound. Is this phrase in the canonical gospel clinching proof that Jesus really did die? We have to ask how closely are we going to read the text? Are we willing to accept that uh, the texts may have been written to explain something that had happened, to reflect on something that had happened? Is it possible that there are elements in here that are uh, historic and elements that are not? Is that possible? Or if we read it really, really closely and say, well, he was speared, and there was clear fluid and there was blood that came out. What does that mean? There is the hint that Jesus' survival of the cross was not an accident, that it was carefully orchestrated, that the timing of the crucifixions had been done so the bodies could come down early, that the substance Jesus was given to drink was there to induce a near-death experience. Well, if you can accept that, can you accept there might have been other elements to the story there to make him look dead? If Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus are all involved in a plot to rescue Jesus and to make him appear dead, well, is it possible the spear story fits into that? Some will say this is impossible because they want to read the text in a fundamentalist way where everything said has to relate to something real that happened. As soon as you allow, there's another way of reading the texts. As soon as you allow that maybe the early church had to write an end to the story of Jesus's ministry in Judea and Jerusalem, well, other possibilities emerge. Does a Jesus who survived the cross remain a Jesus to be followed? If Jesus' life in Palestine 
as recorded in the Jerusalem tradition, was part of a longer life. Does it make the teachings gathered by the Jerusalem tradition irrelevant? Or does it simply mean there is more to be known? What is the impact of stories of Jesus in India or Tibet, Japan, England or France on a personal faith? I'd spent my younger years really as an atheist, really in reaction against my experience of institutional Christianity in my church school. And at a very young age, I just felt this Christianity was really just part of the school's apparatus for managing us and, and controlling us, and I wasn't very impressed with it. I started reading the Gospels, and I began to think that actually this Jesus figure was quite credible and that his teachings were actually quite profound. The moment I realized that the credibility of institutional Christianity and the credibility of an historic Jesus were two different questions, it enabled me to respond to Jesus in a more positive way. I noticed that there was a big difference between the Jesus I was discovering in the Gospels and what I saw the church doing. I began asking questions about the church's claim to authority. The church wants to have the monopoly of information about Jesus. So what do we do with indigenous stories about Jesus from other parts of the world? Because only six years before, I had been in Kashmir, and I knew that in that part of the world, it's just spoken as fact. Jesus was here. Jesus was here when he was younger. And then when I got to Srinagar, there was a claim Jesus was here when he was older. And so I bring these questions back to the church. Well, what about these other stories about Jesus from other places? My mum was a member of the Women's Institute in the UK, and their national anthem as a movement is the hymn Jerusalem, based on the William Blake poem, which is a series of uh, direct claims that Jesus was in England. And it is a very ancient tradition in the west of England, in Somerset, in Cornwall, that Jesus in his youth was in England. So I asked my teachers, well, how did these other claims about Jesus, his life and his teaching and his ministry relate to what we teach here? And they were very, very dismissive. And I couldn't understand that because if Jesus was a real historical person, and if uh, we believe what's in the canonical Gospels, then we've got this huge chunk missing from his life. Where was he? What was he doing? What's the explanation for where he got his great wisdom from? Why are there these very compelling connections between Eastern thought, Buddhist thought, and some of the theology of Jesus and those who wrote for Jesus? Why is it so difficult to set Jesus in a historical context and say Jesus may have had knowledge of world philosophy before he embarked on his teaching ministry? Why is it so offensive to Orthodox Christianity to say he may have been in England or France or Japan or China or India? I know why there's controversy over saying he was there after the crucifixion, but why is it controversial before? So I had these questions from the get-go. The answers I was given were part of a general pattern, the British answer to these questions, taking precedence over the Indian answer. And that would shape what was in my textbooks as a boy at school. Or the Jerusalem story of Jesus taking precedence over the French stories or the English stories. It's really a pattern of the political imperial powers of the day taking priority over indigenous information. You can go to almost any country and see there's a difference between what you'll learn in school and hear on the TV and what you'll hear when you listen to the folkloric level. That's where you'll hear these other stories that say Jesus was here. Jesus was here when he was younger. He was here when he was older. Jesus was here when he was single. Jesus was here when he had a family. There's no reason for me to feel threatened by those stories I'm very happy to listen with an open ear to what they're saying and what information they may have that might add to my knowledge and add to my understanding of what this is all about. I find it really exciting, perpetually rediscovering Jesus, who I think is far more interesting 
that institutional Christianity is often presented, the moment you listen to the world of narratives surrounding him, not just the Jerusalem stories, but the Indian, English, French, Japanese, Chinese stories around the world relating to this historic figure, a more interesting picture opens up. When you start listening to the Gnostic Gospels, a more interesting picture opens up. And I find through my research, when I go back to Jesus, back to the texts and ask, have we been reading that right? I always find that a more interesting and more empowering Jesus emerges. One who shows us just how amazing this human life can be.